Hey, everybody. It is Monday, June 24th, 624 24. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mosh Wanunu. <laughs> we haven't had a, a numerical count in a while, Mosh. Uh, it, I'm it, Jill it feels Agner. right on this 24 24 day. I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. I hope everyone was able to stay as cool as possible this weekend, Jill. Uh, certain parts of the country will continue roasting which we'll get into in the pod. But I know it's hard because a lot of parents out there, this is a crazy time. Yeah, I was about to say, um, I hope all the parents out there are hanging in. This is just an insane time of year. There's graduation parties, end of year stuff, packing for camp. It it just runs the gamut. It feels like every day is something. So I have a lot of friends who are parents and they're just like, Talk to me in two weeks. I mean, we just need to get through maybe till July 4th and then we'll so, feel normal So again. parents out there, we see you, we hear you. Yes, and, uh, hang in. And we're with you. <laughs> yes, hang in there. We're almost done. We're almost there. Speaking of parents, Prince William rocking out to Taylor Swift this weekend. <laughs> yeah, some fun video we rarely see of the royals sort of letting loose. Prince William uh, was with his two <laughs> eldest kids, George and Charlotte, <laughs> at the Taylor Swift show. Takes a selfie with Taylor and uh, Travis Kelsey. So that was fun to see, especially given you know how uh, they've had a very difficult time in that family with, um, with Kate, of course, undergoing cancer treatment. Uh, and his father, uh, same thing. Right. And then there was the video of him in the stands dancing. Yes. I think I watched it four times because I'm like, which one is Prince William? I need to like zoom in. Is he the one waving his arms crazy? Which one is Prince William? Everyone is getting in the mix watching Taylor in all parts of the world, including all the European shows. And Joe, we'll be talking a bit of uh, European travel in today's pod as well. All right, Mosh. So let's get to the headlines. It is debate week. Mosh, are you ready? Are you? I feel like you're stretching. You've got like, yes, the popcorn yeah, no, ready. Some, <laughs> some people's Super Bowl is the actual Super Bowl. Jill, this is my Super Bowl. <laughs> so we'll talk about how Donald Trump and Joe Biden are preparing for this week's first presidential debate and what we are hearing about Trump's VP pick. And as it feels like everyone you know is heading to Europe for vacation this summer, a debate in countries like Portugal and Greece about the downsides of a of an American tourist surge. The Supreme Court rules nearly unanimously on a major gun case that will keep weapons out of the hands of domestic abusers. An investigation into the increasing number of non-Latin Americans coming across the U.S. border, specifically from West Africa and India, and how they're getting here. As many Americans suffer under record heat this week, we have a look at the July monthly forecast Get ready for some more records to be broken. Got milk, specifically raw milk, inside the dairy debate heating up online and why it has gotten political. Plus, Moshe is on this day in history. Jill, one of my favorite topics, Henry VIII, and the, <laughs> the story behind Sweet Home Alabama, the song, uh, an aspect of it you may have not heard about. All right, starting with debate prep, we are officially three days out from the first presidential debate. What is likely to be the most important moment in this presidential election so far? Ahead of Thursday night's debate in Atlanta, President Biden and former President Trump are prepping in very different ways. Biden went to the secluded presidential retreat of Camp David Friday, and he's been on lockdown with several advisors prepping. They've been conducting mock debates. He is set to be there pretty much until the actual debate. Longtime Democratic lawyer Bob Bauer playing the part of Trump during the mock sessions, just like he did back in 2020. Biden getting ready to respond to various Trump statements. He's also prepping to talk policy, and he's planning to quote back some extreme remarks that Trump has made this past year, like his vow to be a dictator for his first day in office. Meanwhile, Trump continues to travel and do campaign events, although he is talking through debate strategy with advisors. Trump is aiming to assure voters that he can be a steadier and more effective leader than Biden and tell Americans that his four years were better for voters than Biden's were. Some of his debate prep has focused less on policy and more on rhetoric. Trump has previously struggled with policy debates. He's also been quick to show aggression in past debates, 
including speaking over his opponents and attacking the moderators, moves that stuck with viewers in the months that followed. So Trump advisors say none of the former president's sessions so far have included mock debates or role playing, something the Trump campaign actually has no plans for the former president to engage in, which is a departure from 2020. If you remember, that is when Trump faced off behind closed doors with former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who was standing in for Biden. Now, as far as the rules go, the Biden and Trump campaigns have both agreed to mic muting, podiums, and no studio audience uh, as part of this upcoming CNN debate. So mark your calendar, 9 p.m. Eastern, Thursday night. Uh, we will be uh, doing live commentary on the Instagram account Thursday night. So be ready to have your second screen experience with us uh, over on the Mo News Instagram account. We'll tell you about it all week. But I'm hoping to give you a behind-the-scenes glimpse and real-time analysis as the debate is going on. But back to the debate itself. Some Republicans are encouraging Trump to avoid a repeat of his very aggressive 2020 approach. Some of his advisors, going back to Christie back in 2020, say, you know, don't be aggressive. Let Biden trip up. Let him fail with words uh, as opposed to being super aggressive. That said, Trump appears undaunted here. He pulled the audience at one of his events over the weekend, Jill, and asked the audience, like, how should I play this uh, contest? Should I be tough and nasty? These are Trump's words here. Should I be tough and nasty and just say, you're the worst president in history? Or should I be nice and calm and let him speak? Unsurprisingly, the followers, the crowd roared when he said, should I be tough and nasty? And then booed when he asked uh, the crowd at his rally uh, whether he should be calm and let President Biden speak. Trump has uh, given a number of remarks over the weekend, trying to set expectations here. Uh, he was mocking Biden for going to Camp David to practice for six days, saying that uh, Crooked Joe's gone to a log cabin to study and prepare. I don't think he did. He's sleeping because they want him good and strong. And then, Jill, as he's done a couple times in the past, he suggested that Joe Biden will take drugs before the debate. Take a listen. I want to get him good and strong so a little before debate time he gets a shot in the ass. And that's... <laughs> they want to strengthen him up. So he comes out. He'll come out. I Okay. I say he'll come out all jacked up, right? All jacked up. Jill, all jacked up. <laughs> That's what former President Trump says Biden will be. He will be all jacked up on drugs. Uh, in the past, Trump has said there should be a drug <laughs> test before the debate. <laughs> something the White House, the Biden White House said, like, are you kidding us right now? But that's how it's interesting because it, 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 it provides it's interesting because there's a conundrum for Trump, right, who uh, the right is often talking about how, you know, Biden is bumbling, is not all there, uh, is, you know, sort of like loopy and old and incoherent. And Obama is actually running the entire White House. That's one accusation. At the same time, they have to explain why Biden at the State of the Union and debates tends to come with energy. So the the explanation Trump has come upon here is that his opponent is on drugs. So for the State of the Union, it was cocaine. That right. was the accusation. Right. Trump said that Biden did cocaine. OK, so now for the debate. Just so I'm clear, a shot in the behind tush. Yeah. What, is that what like adrenaline? What is what is he's he not being specific. suggesting? Jill, there's no evidence. <laughs> there's no evidence being cited here. It's just <laughs> this is Trump on the campaign stop. That said, uh, that said, this debate is a big deal. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, it's Sorry. a serious thing. And yet this is where we are as a country. Um but there are legitimate questions, right, that Americans have of both candidates. Uh, there are questions about their age, right? You're, you're the two oldest men in American history are running for president. You have Trump at 78, Biden at 81. For many Americans, it's going to be the first time seeing Trump for 90 straight minutes on live television uh, for the first time in like three and a half years since the man was president. So uh, this will be a reminder for many folks of you know, Trump, who, unless you've been heavily involved in politics or watching the coverage on cable news, you haven't really been plugged in for more than a soundbite here or there. Uh, remember, Trump skipped all the GOP primary debates. So his style here could matter why you have some people on his side saying, hey, can you chill out for us uh, versus being super aggressive? So we'll see which Trump we get at the same time for President Biden. This is a huge deal, which may explain why he's spending a week at Camp David, preparing here. There have been multiple videos of late showing him sort of looking out of it. Now, the White House has been calling those uh, fake or manipulated. They're not fake. We've looked at the raw video. It does appear at times 
where there might be an explanation as to why um, why Biden is looking in a certain direction, but still, you know, he's moving slower. And so Americans are, uh, an increasing number of Americans are getting a feeling like, oh, is this guy in it to win it? Does he have gas in the tank for four more years? So Biden has to showcase on Thursday night that he still has it, right? And so there's a lot at stake here. I thought Carl Rove, who was the senior advisor to President Bush uh, for his two terms and helped lead him uh, to win in 2000 and then 2004, summed it up uh, very well in the New York Times over the weekend. Carl Rove saying, this is a big inflection point, asking the question, can Biden be consistently cogent, causing people to say, well, maybe the old guy is up to it? And is Trump going to be sufficiently restrained that people say, you know what? It really is about us, not about him. So that is the the challenge that uh, Karl Rove says both men have. Now, will this change polls right away? Unlikely, unless there's some sort of disaster. But uh, for many folks on both campaigns, they believe this will be a moment Thursday night that for the first time, a number of Americans will begin to pay attention to the election. That said, we're still five months out. And regardless of what happens on Thursday night, there's still a lot of campaign to go. Just listening to that Karl Rove quote that you read, Mosh, the bar is so incredibly low. It's really sad, uh, to be honest, for for this country. Can Biden be cogent and can Trump uh, be chill and convince and, and talk less about himself and more about the country? That's really the bar by which, and I think it's a fair judgment, that many Americans will be judging these two guys. Uh, Meanwhile, we are getting word from Trump himself that he's picked his vice president. What do we know? All right. So uh, we believe he will make the announcement July 15th at the Republican convention, which, believe it or not, is about three weeks away now, Jill. But he's already indicating to reporters on the campaign trail that he's made his choice. Uh, He says the person doesn't know yet, but he's made his decision Now, Trump is known to change his mind uh, based on the last person he spoke to, uh, you know, based on the latest development. That said, that's his claim. Uh, This is what we know right now based on the people around him. Uh, Candidate number one, his top choice right now, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. You might recognize him from the campaign trail. He ran briefly for president, didn't really get much buzz, um, hardly passed one percent in the polls. But that's one of the reasons why Trump likes him. He's sort of chill, laid back, won't try to stand in front of Trump, uh, will know his place as vice president. So Doug Burgum right now viewed as the do no harm VP choice for Trump. Uh, A couple other contenders here that are high up and he may have decided on J.D. Vance, the former author turned senator from Ohio, uh, and then Marco Rubio, also a senator from Florida. Uh, Basically, it looks like it's one of those three right now. And there's a lot of people around Trump who are pushing him in each direction. You have, according to NBC News, Rupert Murdoch. You you have, according to multiple media outlets, Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox, is supporting Burgum. Then you have Don Trump Jr., Steve Bannon, the advisor, and Tucker Carlson, who allegedly are telling Trump to choose J.D. Vance. Then you have Sean Hannity, the Fox commentator, and Kellyanne Conway, the former Trump advisor, sort of current Trump advisor, urging Marco Rubio. So different people around uh, Trump in his orbit, each saying you should go with this individual is your VP for a variety of reasons. Again, he doesn't want people who are going to threaten him politically. He wants someone who can carry the torch as MAGA. uh, And they're figuring out how to roll this out because July is going to be key in the coming weeks. Remember, July 11th is Trump's sentencing in the New York criminal case. So we'll see what happens there. And then just a few days later is the RNC. So where he'll make his VP announcement therein uh, will be a good question. Yeah, and if you want to try reading the tea leaves, I guess you could look for all of them. We'll be at the debate. Uh, They'll all probably be doing media at some point. And as you said, Mosh, because Donald Trump hasn't officially made the announcement, who knows? Potentially his mind could be changed. Jill, I don't know if you heard that in the background. Uh, Olivia, my nine-month-old, I think she's trying to make her uh, VP prediction in the background as I record the podcast, but I wasn't able to quite make it out. Olivia is always a welcome cameo, Mosh. (laughs) Olivia, we're talking about you on the podcast. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Stay far away from politics, girl. Jill, before we leave politics, uh, we should note we have a special edition of the Mo News interview podcast with uh, Chief Washington Correspondent for ABC News, John Carl, uh, live right now. And in it, he goes into what he's hearing from his sources about Trump's VP choice, debate prep, and just what's at stake in this election based on his reporting so far. So go check that out. And if you haven't already started listening today, check out the Mo News interview podcast wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's talk travel right now. As so many people.
people are either heading to Europe or just got back from there in recent months. Across Southern Europe, an unprecedented tourism boom driven largely by American tourists is turbocharging growth in places that had become bywords for economic stagnation. It's created hundreds of thousands of jobs and boosted the bottom line for governments recently shaken by sovereign debt fears and collapses. The rush is turning Europe's recent economic history on its head. So in the 2010s, Germany and other manufacturing heavy economies helped drag the continent out of its debt crisis. They were lifting up the Mediterranean countries' economies and bailing them out. But today, Italy, Spain, Greece, and Portugal contribute between a quarter and half of the bloc's annual growth. While Germany's economy is flatlining, Spain is Europe's fastest growing big economy. Nearly three quarters of the country's recent growth and one in four new jobs are linked to tourism. In Greece, they are seeing a surging economy. 44% of all jobs are connected to tourism. The short term is bright and governments are pushing to build on that momentum. But some economists, residents and politicians are concerned about the boom's long term implications. Rent and other living expenses are rising in hot spots, making it harder for many locals to make ends meet. A focus on tourism, which does turn a quick profit still tethers these economies to this highly cyclical industry, and it also risks keeping workers and capital from more profitable areas like tech and high-end manufacturing. Yeah, the big question in Europe, especially in these Southern European countries, is they're getting this boost right now from tourism, but how long can it last? And it really is contingent on Americans continuing to come, uh, the American economy remaining strong, and Americans continuing to be interested in Southern Europe. So, Building an entire economy around this uh, is risky. It's sort of like in the Middle East, Jill, you know, the uh, economies that are, that are transitioning off of the high of oil all these years. But seeing what's going on with uh, newer energy, cleaner energy, they realize they have to develop their economies in different ways. And that takes a lot of work. Uh, and that's some of the message that's being said within Southern Europe, like, hey, we need to prepare for a non-tourism scenario. At the same time, a lot of governments don't want to hear it. Because they're expanding their airports, they're expanding their industry, they're, you know, really kind of boosting the hotel sector, uh, and they're seeing a huge amount of income from this right now. And they're not wrong. Right now, spending on travel and hospital has grown seven times faster than the entire global economy over the past two years. And that pattern is expected to continue at least for the next decade. And the numbers here are pretty incredible for Europe, though it's home to just 5% of the world's population lives in the EU. It received a third of all international tourism dollars more than $500 billion last year alone. That's up roughly three times over the last 20 years. And compares to the U.S., which sees about $150 billion in tourism, again, you're seeing 3x that uh, in Europe. So the Wall Street Journal took a deep dive into this uh, over the weekend. Uh, they noted that Americans have now surpassed Spaniards as the biggest group of foreign tourists in Portugal. Pretty notable since Portugal borders Spain, as in connected to Spain in many ways. There are now more Americans visiting Portugal than Spaniards visiting Portugal. And they dive into Portugal here, which, by the way, I remember working at Bloomberg in 2011 when they received a huge bailout when their economy was collapsing in 2011. As part of their uh, economic rejuvenation, they privatized their airline. And who took a controlling stake in that? A guy named David Neeleman, who founded uh, JetBlue. He's a Brazilian guy. And one of the things he did with the Portuguese airline, which is leading to the success, particularly of Portugal, Jill, right now, is he added hubs and direct flights between Portugal and JFK, Portugal and uh, Boston Logan. And that has really blown up the market there as the booking sword for TAP, the Portuguese airline. A number of other U.S. airliners followed. And so he jokes to the Wall Street Journal that uh, as of a few years ago, he heard of no one who's ever been to Portugal today. Everyone is telling me they're going to Portugal. Uh, Jill, I remember being in Portugal back in 2016. Saw almost no Americans there at the time. And I heard from people over the weekend as we talked about this on the premium account. And, and all they're hearing right now is English. And all they're running into is uh, fellow Americans. They're like, here we thought we were doing something different and cool, <laughs> and it's just Americans speaking well, English. <laughs> I feel like, you know, you have all these trends. I feel like 10 years ago, I was like Dubrovnik. Remember, like, everyone was going to Croatia for a bit, and then, like, Italy was popping. And now, like, 
Iceland was popping, and now Portugal is is all the rage. I uh, heard from dozens of Mo News community members who are headed to Portugal. No criticism there, but it's incredible how some small decisions have a huge impact, uh, in specifically in the case of, of the Portuguese airline, TAP, creating those hubs, creating those direct flights multiple times a day between Lisbon and New York and Lisbon and Boston. A very smart business move. Uh, This does, though, have downsides for the locals, the most immediate of which is the rise in living costs. The average Portuguese employee earns about $1,100 or 1,000 euros a month after tax. A one-bedroom apartment in Lisbon can easily cost more than 500,000 euros to buy or over 1,200 euros a month to rent. Rents in nearby cities are also climbing as people leave the capital, squeezed out as lucrative short-term rentals transform the housing market. Around 9 in 10 Airbnb hosts in Portugal rent their family home, and almost half say that the extra income helps them afford to stay in their homes. Higher rents are forcing many businesses and cultural and social spaces catering to locals to close. Yeah, so that's one of the issues here as you're talking about this tourism boom is uh, the locals are being impacted here. It's changing uh, the nature of uh, the country, of societies, of cities. At the same time, the boosters in those countries say, listen, let's use all this money to build our economy, build the larger tech sector, build uh, production uh, and things that will work for us long term in places like Portugal. But short term, there's some political impact you're already seeing pushback, you know, this feeling that Airbnb and Uber are the ones that are really making big Big money uh, off of this, and it's coming at the expense of uh, you know Portuguese people who aren't involved in the tourism sector. So we thought interesting thing to dive into here. We dive into it in the newsletter today as well, uh, because uh, you know as we talk about the tourism boom, there are a lot of deeper issues to uh, get into here uh, and the impacts that they have on various countries. Time for the speed read from The Washington Post. The Supreme Court upheld a federal law Friday that bans guns for domestic abusers. The court rejected an argument pressed by gun rights groups that the prohibition violated the Second Amendment. The justices ruled eight to one in favor of a 1994 ban on firearms for people under restraining orders to stay away from their spouses or partners. The justices reversed a ruling from a lower federal appeals court that had struck down the law on Second Amendment grounds. Justice Clarence Thomas was the only dissent. The ruling indicates that some longstanding gun laws are likely to survive despite the court's 2022 decision that expanded gun rights by finding for the first time that there is a right to bear arms outside the home under the Constitution's Second Amendment. Yeah, gun rights advocates thought they uh, could win this one based on the 2022 decision. Uh, The court ruling the conservatives, the liberals, again, except for Clarence Thomas, saying, no, this seems like a reasonable law, right? for the 8-1 majority, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that since the U.S. was founded on, quote, our nation's firearms laws have included provisions preventing individuals who threaten physical harm to others from misusing firearms. This provision, quote, fits comfortably within this tradition. This case, Jill, involved a Texas man who had assaulted his girlfriend, had a restraining order against him, had fired shots in public, and so a protective order prohibited him from having a gun, but police, actually, he was a suspect in a number of cases, police searched his home, found a gun, he He argued that based on the Second Amendment, regardless of all this other stuff, he should still have a right to carry a gun. Turns out the court says no. And this is good news for domestic violence victims. Uh, The numbers are pretty stark here. Women are five times more likely to die in a domestic violence situation if a gun is present. That's why many states and the federal government prohibit people subject to domestic violence protection orders from having guns. The research has shown that the laws work. This came up in the case that it has reduced these laws, intimate partner homicide by up to 12 percent. When you have that law against domestic abusers owning guns, Uh, Jill, that was one of the big cases we were watching for. We previewed it in last week's newsletter. There's also a number of uh, cases we're still waiting for uh, that likely to come down this week. A case related to January 6th and whether uh, several hundred of the cases might be thrown out against some of the rioters. There's the big Trump case, his argument that he has presidential immunity for life, how the court will decide on that will be key. There's an abortion case out of Idaho, whether federal law on the need to give an emergency abortion overrides a state ban there. And then a number of cases related to the future of social media and how social media can be limited by states. Uh, So we're going to be watching all those this week. From Reuters, migrants from outside Latin America are paying smuggling networks hefty fees for travel packages that can include airline tickets, 
on charter and commercial airlines to fly to Central America and then bus rides and hotel stays en route to the U.S.-Mexico border. More than 2 million migrants were arrested at the southern U.S. border last year. Nearly 10 percent of irregular crossings at the U.S. border involved migrants from outside of Latin America, just under about 200,000 people, according to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. A decade ago, people from outside the Americas accounted for barely 1 percent of irregular Regular arrivals. Indian nationals were the largest single group from outside the Americas encountered at the border last year, comprising about 42,000 arrivals. Migrants from 15 West African nations accounted for about another 40,000, with most from Senegal and Mauritania. The Biden administration attributes the historic levels of migration to global economic and political instability. Trump has blamed the high border crossings on Biden's policies. Yeah, so this Reuters investigation found two major routes uh, for non-Latin Americans into the Americas and up to the U.S. border. Uh, one route starts in West Africa with migrants paying about $10,000 for multi-stop commercial flights to Nicaragua and then continuing by land to the U.S., then there's a second route serving migrants mainly from India that offers charter flights to Central America, then overland transfers, those hotel stays, etc. Now, this goes between seventy two and ninety six thousand dollars per person. The belief is that that gets them in successfully into America, whereas applying for a tourist visa and overstaying is getting more and more difficult. These routes through Central America also avoid visa requirements that are related to flying directly into Mexico. So they're coming into a couple of key transit points, including Nicaragua. That's where the president is. Daniel Ortega. He's a key adversary of the U.S. He's a former Marxist guerrilla, Cold War adversary. Uh, he's been called out by Washington. He does not care. He's making money off of all of this. So he's having a whole bunch of people fly into Nicaragua. And if you look at the numbers, there are way more people arriving in Nicaragua than ever leaving Nicaragua via airfare, via airports. And so uh, it's clear that people are coming in and then moving by land uh, north. Now, the Biden administration has been working with a number of regional governments. Nicaragua is difficult, but countries like El Salvador, they're trying to coordinate with them, trying to make it more difficult uh, for this sort of thing to go on. Uh, leaders in El Salvador say that they are collaborating with the U.S. to fight this. They've introduced visa requirements, including $1,000 transit fees for citizens of India and African countries to transit through their country. That, they say, has drastically reduced the number of migrants. Uh, so this is certainly a story uh, we will keep watching for you. From Fox Weather as more than 100 million Americans were under heat warnings this weekend. And the heat dome is expected to continue for most of this week for the East Coast. We are getting a preview for next month. Some bad news. It looks like we could have another record month ahead. The latest climate outlooks for July show that NOAA expects much of the country to exhibit above average temperatures, while many communities will see below average rainfall. Typically, July is the warmest month around the country with average highs in the 80s and 90s, but with the addition of heat waves, normal might feel downright cool compared to what the country is expected to experience. Yeah, so the temperature outlook from NOAA shows that most of the country is in store for heat that has a higher probability of being more extreme than usual, with only the West Coast in line for normal temperatures. So congratulations, West Coast. But if you live in the Rockies, the Mid-Atlantic from Ohio, to North Carolina, the Northeast, uh, those are the areas with the highest probability of seeing record temps uh, above normal here. Now, this is a long-term outlook. So this is their uh, best projection. Jill, you'll have to wait for more short-term forecast to really get a sense of what your weather might be. And of course, if there's a whole bunch of hurricanes that come through, uh, that could mess with things. Speaking of abnormal weather, uh, there's a flooding emergency that we've been watching in Iowa. Floodwaters forced people out of their homes in parts of Iowa over the weekend, the result of weeks of rain. There were sirens that blared in the early morning in a town of Rock Valley, Iowa, that has a population of about 4,200, where people in hundreds of homes were told to get out as soon as possible. That's where the Rock River uh, could no longer take the rain that has slammed the region, Jill. Pretty tragic photos of a community underwater there in Iowa. Right, and on Saturday, the governor of Iowa, Kim Reynolds, issued a disaster proclamation for 21 counties in northwest Iowa and directed all available state resources to assist Rock Valley and other communities in response to that catastrophic flooding. A level three of four risk of excessive rainfalls in place over southern Wisconsin and northeastern Iowa. And Moshe, I think it's just a good reminder that when we talk about flooding, even if you don't live by the coast, that doesn't mean that you're not at risk of, of serious flooding. In this case, it was just rainfall that the earth couldn't absorb in time. 
especially if you're an Iowan, you know that you've experienced, there have been a number of floods in recent years. Uh, but in many cases, sometimes you just have storms that now sit and give you a record number of rain in just a few hours. You saw that in Tennessee last year. So definitely have your weather app alerts on this summer because some of this stuff seems seemingly sometimes comes out of nowhere. And finally, from the Wall Street Journal, got milk, specifically raw milk. For more than 130 years, Americans have been instructed that drinking milk that comes directly from a cow's udder can be dangerous. The U.S. dairy industry spends millions of dollars each year heating its product to 145 degrees before sale. That's a way to kill microorganisms that can make people sick. But a growing number of consumers would rather they left it alone. Raw milk is now on sale in corner shop and trendy health food stores across America. Its proponents argue that it helps with weight loss, gut health, and lactose intolerance. Gwyneth Paltrow, the actress and longtime promoter of unorthodox health advice, takes it in her coffee every morning. So pasteurization, which was once just the consensus, has become the latest frontier in America's culture war. An increasing number of lifestyle influencers and the libertarian right are advocating for it, saying that pasteurization kills some nutrients in dairy, and it is basically the government killing choice. It has become a political issue for people like RFK Jr., who is demanding choice, as well as many supporters of Donald Trump. Yeah, they argue the government has no business demanding that their milk be pasteurized and that raw milk bans are a product of the big dairy industry lobbyists operating in the quote unquote swamp. Uh, Jill, if you've listened to various lifestyle influencers as well as some podcasts uh, in uh, recent months or recent years, even uh, you've heard more and more of this uh uh, among them, Lauren Bostick of the Skinny Confidential podcast, who talks about having uh, her own raw milk dealer. Uh, Paltrow was actually on her show talking about how she drinks raw milk in her coffee every day. Uh, notably, in some states, it's legal to buy raw milk as pet food, which is a loophole uh, for people in a number of states. In other cases, you simply just drive across state lines uh, to get raw milk. 20 states have laws on the books prohibiting raw milk in some form. The FDA says uh, the FDA warns that drinking unpasteurized milk can cause bacterial outbreaks. It can result in miscarriages, stillbirths, kidney failure, uh, death even in some cases. Uh, the FDA attributes going back 30 years here, 143 deaths to various illnesses that have been linked to raw milk. Uh, though notably in places like California, it's legal. Uh, in half the states, it is is legal. Uh, and then in half the states, it is not legal. So it has led here to this big debate. Uh, market data suggests that there's been a 20% increase in the demand for raw milk in the last year nationwide. Uh, you're seeing a number of states look to liberalize their laws uh, when it comes to pasteurization. Uh, Louisiana is looking at repealing their ban on unpasteurized milk. You're seeing similar efforts in West Virginia, Iowa, Georgia and North Dakota. So an interesting trend here. I've certainly heard about it here uh, in, in Brooklyn. And again, you have the, the lifestyle influencers and again, the kind of libertarian right. You're seeing at the at the big Trump rallies, a lot of talk of this, as well as the RFK rallies. At the same time, you have the, the health authorities and it comes amid, you know, overall distrust in the FDA, the CDC, et cetera. Uh, but most notably, we heard this warning recently when it comes to the avian flu in milk. The pasteurization uh, kills avian flu in milk. So people should be very wary of raw milk right now. That's what you're hearing from the FDA and public health officials. Most, were you a fan of Schitt's Creek? I was a fan, but I, I I wasn't a religious viewer. It is one of my favorite shows, and there happens to be a great episode where they kind of like get into the raw milk business, <laughs> real tapping into this, I guess, before it's time. Uh, very funny. They, they were early on, on Schitt's Creek, <laughs> on the whole raw milk thing. But it's been a thing for a number of years, particularly in California, uh, but it's, it's really blown up in the last year uh, or two uh, across the country here in the U.S. All right, now time for On This Day in History. We begin 500 years ago. On this day in 1509, Henry VIII was crowned King of England. His wife, Catherine of Aragon, was crowned Queen Consort. They had just married a couple of weeks before Catherine had actually been married to Henry's brother uh, before he died. Henry would then marry Catherine. He would then get separated from Catherine, the Pope not giving him the right to divorce. So then Henry started his own church, the Church of England, the England Church that exists today. He would go on to marry Anne Boleyn, uh, but then end up beheading her because he because she gave him no male heir. He accused her of adultery. Jill, one of my favorite historical topics, Henry VIII, six wives. He would end up having six wives, and their fate can be remembered this way. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived, 
That's your rhyme. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's fast forward here to the 21st century. It was just three years ago today that that beachfront condo building collapsed in Surfside, Florida. That was the 12-story building. 98 people would die in that collapse. The disaster, one of the worst of its kind in U.S. history. An investigation later would uncover design failures, shoddy construction, structural damage, and a whole bunch of neglect that led to a chain reaction leading to that collapse in Surfside. Engineers believe that the cause of the collapse was a structural column uh, or concrete slab that gave way. And then just two years ago, on this day in history, in 2022, the Supreme Court would issue its Dobbs decision ending constitutional protections for abortion that had been in place for nearly 50 years under Roe v. Wade. Uh, that outcome, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, left it to the states. Uh, more than a dozen states have now banned abortion since then. And uh, as any regular listener of this podcast would know, the issue continues to go before the court. And finally, a bit of pop culture music history for you on this day, turning 50 years old today. Leonard Skinner released Sweet Home Alabama on this day, June 24th, 1974, Jill. Fun fact, none of the three writers of the song were actually from Alabama. Ronnie Van Sant and Gary Rossington were both, were both Floridians. Ed King was from California. So you had two Floridians and a Californian write Sweet Home Alabama. So the song, despite none of them being from Alabama, was actually a response to Neil Young's song a couple of years previous to that Southern Man. You might have heard of that song. Uh, they felt that that song blamed the entire South, all Southerners, for slavery. So Neil Young is actually name-checked in uh, Sweet Home Alabama uh, and dissed in the lyrics. Uh, back then, Leonard Skinner was performing in front of a large Confederate flag. Actually, the record label suggested that uh, to boost their audience in the South. Uh, they insist, though... The song is about Southern pride, but not about racism or advocating racism. But it's hard to know because a, a major tragedy would befall uh, members of the group just three years after that song comes out. In 1977, there is a uh, plane crash that kills three members of Leonard Skinner, uh, including one of the writers of the song. So uh, just what I thought, Jill, interesting uh, opportunity to discuss the history here of Sweet Home Alabama. The history is fascinating, and it's also just incredible how much – just culturally, the United States has changed that the record label thought it was a good idea for them to perform that in front of a Confederate flag. That was less than 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. And I mean, Jill, remember, you know, some people might remember the show Dukes of Hazard, where they had uh, the rebel flag on, on the car in Dukes of Hazard. So uh, a major cultural shift in the last few decades, you could say. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Mo News podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode and review us in the App Store. Yes. And a reminder again to go check out the Mo News interview podcast, where our latest conversation dives into 2024, the debate, the VP choice, and the state of our elections. Go check that out again. Mo News, the interview podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Bye, everybody.